Sunday. Uh, thankful each of you are here. Also thankful for air conditioning. Anybody else? Okay, you've got a clap somewhere in the back. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Excited to be with you this morning. Uh, I just have a few brief things I want to put before you by way of announcements. We're going to read some scripture and we're going to sing together. And the first one is uh, we have a potluck happening today. The grill masters are already at work. It would be a shame for you to disrespect them by not staying and having a burger. <laughs> so I would encourage you, uh, there'll be some awesome food happening. Uh, stick around after service for our potluck today. And then a couple things happening this week I want to I wanna mention is Tuesday morning at 6.30 here at Trailhead. We have a men's breakfast taking place. We'd love to have all you men there, 6.30, usually done by 8 or so uh, to get you out of there for work that as part of your schedule. So we'd love to have you here at 6.30 for the men's breakfast this Tuesday. Wednesday evening is summer youth group getting back together starting at 6 p.m. Meal will be provided. We'd love to have all the youth there uh, looking forward to that time together this coming Wednesday. <laughs> Outside of that, we have some expansion updates there. Also some VBS ways to pray that is coming up quickly. Get your kids registered for that. Um, but outside of that, I want to go to Psalm 23 this morning. So get a Bible on your lap there. We're going to read Psalm 23 together. We're going to read all six verses this morning, starting in verse 1. So Psalm 23, verse 1, says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that good? Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? God, what a great text, common text that we know and we love. Uh, Lord, we just acknowledge you as our shepherd this morning. And in you, we have all that we need. Lord, we lack nothing. We shall not want. You lead us. You guide us. You are with us. Uh, your goodness and your mercy literally are chasing us down daily. And through Christ, we dwell uh, in your presence forever. Uh, we give thanks today. Lord, we, we take this day, we lay it at your feet, asking you to move, do what you want, have your way today. Teach us, would you guide us? Would you grow us? May you receive glory for, for our time. Lord, through worship, through song, uh, through your word, through fellowship over a good meal, uh, all we pray that it's all for your glory. Help us to sing, worship you, Lord, to an audience of one. This morning, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up, church. We're going to sing this morning.
to sing a newer song that Pastor Mark introduced to us uh, two weeks ago called All Things, uh, rooted in Romans 8, 28. Um, and what a timely truth. Uh, if, you, if you look at our prayer chain in a week's time, uh, just some hard things, some broken things, and how much a bedrock is it for us to stand on the truth that God works all things, including those hard things that come across the prayer chain, uh, for the good of those who love him. God is somehow working good in the midst of broken things. Anybody need to hear that today? I do. I do. Let's sing about it. When my heart was cold and like this, and I wandered in my blindness, you pursued.
Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be here with each of you this morning. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, it says that God is working all things out according to the counsel of his will. There's, there's something that took place yesterday that I just want to address before we go any further together. I know that it's on many of your minds, and that was the shooting that happened at the Donald Trump rally in Pennsylvania. Of course, I think that most of you are aware that he was um, shot, he was hit in the ear, um, and I think by all accounts, he's going to be okay. Um, but there was, um, I, I don't even know, was it a man that was killed? Um, and then there were, there were several others that were injured. Um, where else do we turn in, in times like these? I mean, because don't we think about the political turmoil that we're headed for in the next number of months? Uh, no, like him or not, um, like his politics or not, is, is, that a, is that a sign of what's to come? We don't know. The, the question for us as believers is, where do we turn? And, and where is our hope really found? Our, our hope is found in the Lord. It has to be. Otherwise, we have no hope. That's what's been striking me in the last 12 hours or so, maybe 15, 16, 18 hours. I don't even know what time it was that we first heard the news yesterday. God is our refuge and strength, a never-present help in times of trouble. Do we need his intervention in our country? Do we need it today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should it wake us up? Should it wake our, the church up in the United States? If we weren't awake before, are we awake now? Should we be awake now? I think so. I think so. We are in desperate need of the Lord to move, to bring repentance, to help people see their sin and their need for the Savior. And that is part of the reason that when you come here to Trailhead Christian Fellowship Church, you will hear what the answer is. You will hear who the answer is. It's Christ. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. And do we believe that he is working all things for the good of those who love him? All things. Trials we went through this past week. The, the, the severe cold that I came down with on Thursday morning. I, I mean, it, it, uh, there are many, many more examples that I could give. By the way, I shook some of your hands before church. That was because I had just washed my hands. I want you to know that. After church, it's going to be more of the fist bumps, okay? Elbow bumps, whatever. I, I, I'm going to run for the sanitizer after church before I shake more hands. I'll just, I just want you to know we safety first. It's part of the reason that I am passionate about preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified is because he is the answer. He, he is what our country needs today. He's always been the answer. He's always been the need at every hour in history, no matter how bleak it's been. So we turn to him this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. 
the book of Hebrews chapter 12. If you're looking along at your pew Bible, I believe this should be on page 1008. Some of you might find it on page 948, the really, really thin microscopic print Bibles. Um, before I do get into this text, before I read this text for you this morning, I wanted to say a big thank you to Levi Van Zee for preaching an excellent sermon last week, the, the end of chapter 11. I thought Levi did an excellent job handling that text, encouraging us from that text. I just wanted to say thank you, even though he's not here this morning. Um, thank you to Levi I do want to acknowledge, some of you are aware of this, some of you maybe haven't heard this yet, that Beth and I did move this past week. In fact, we sold our home on Cherry Street to Levi and Alicia. It was kind of out of the blue, um, and we moved um, kind of in a hurry um, to 500 South Cedar Street. Um, and so I just want you to know, um, there was some talk this past week about this mystery place where the Roloffs were living. Um, someone even thought maybe we were on the, the roof of the Betsy. Um, that's not true. Um, a, as appealing as that was, um, we chose to go a different route. Um, but, but you are all welcome to visit us at 500 South um, Cedar. And I just have to make mention that it had nothing to do with the neighbors in the neighborhood. Several of you are neighbors. Um, we got the Hazlets and we got the Lewises and we got the Cantrells and, and the Van Zees. There's lots of neighbors from our church that live in the neighborhood. It wasn't because of any of you. I just have to assure you of that. Um, but yes, so we did move and that's where you can find us. Um, I do need to make mention this morning one other thing. Some of you have seen this in the bulletin about the expansion. I think most of you are aware that I do not like to talk about money. First of all, I have no idea how to handle it. When I was in, actually after I graduated from college, the way that I balanced my checking account was to close that checking account. <laughs> and... That is no lie. My wife handles our finances. I don't like money. I know it's needed. I, I don't like talking about it. I don't want to be that pastor who's always talking about money. I think if you know me, I, I, I think most of you know me well enough, I rarely talk about money. This morning, I have to talk about money. In regards to our expansion, we are about $100,000 short. And... That, that's kind of always been the case, but we're getting to the point now where the money that's been raised has basically been accounted for, like it's been spent. And so what we're asking you to do, and, and again, this is not to put pressure on anybody, okay? Everybody repeat after me. This is not to put pressure on anybody. Okay, I heard one person in the front here. This is not to put pressure on anybody. But if we divide up the amount that's needed, the $100,000 or so that's needed, if we divide it up among our members, the members of the church, the households that are represented in our membership, each, if each family gave about $1,300, we would be able to get there. We'd be able to get to the point where all of our bills would be covered, where the, the rest of the expenses would be covered for the expansion. And so I'm just putting that out there for you. The other elders put me up to this. And so I just wanted <laughs> to let you know that. Um, I know, I know. I'm going to blame someone else. Uh, but I do want to be honest with you about that. That's, that's where the expansion is at. The Lord has provided so incredibly graciously for us in regards to the expansion. And we, are, we can see the finish line. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You just need a little bit of help to get there. 
So I'm going to be reading Hebrews chapter 12. Then I'm going to pray my prayer this morning. I want to, I want to just I want to tell you this right now. My prayer this morning is probably not going to be the shortest prayer I've ever prayed. I, I just want you to know that right now. But I'm going to invite you as a congregation because <clears throat> the Lord calls us to pray. We, we pray for our country. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for those in our body that are in need of prayer. And so I want to encourage you not to tune me out as we go to prayer, but to be in prayer with me as we lift these things, these needs to the Lord together. So would you do that with me? The book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is before us, looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the, the, the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to each of us this morning. Would you bow your heads as we pray together? Dear Father, this morning, we do want to lift up our nation and Father, we pray that you would heal our land. And dear Father, we pray that you, would, that you would be calling us as a church to repentance. Dear Father, we pray that, that you would be calling this nation to repentance. That there would be sweeping revival in this country. Dear Father, that you would pour out your spirit on this land. Dear Father, we could go on and on about the ills that we see all around us. But Father, I think this morning it's enough. It's, it's enough to say, Lord, help us. We need you. We need the Savior. We need the Holy Spirit to be working, to be drawing men and women, boys and girls to Christ. And dear Father, we are grateful for the truth that you were able to do exceedingly more than all that we can ask or imagine. Dear Father, this is not too difficult for you. Your Father, we praise you for sparing former President Trump's life. And your Father, we pray for healing, for quick healing for him. Your Father, we pray for those, the family members of 
the man who lost his life. And dear Father, for those that were injured, we pray for healing for them. We pray for comfort for them. Dear Father, this was senseless evil, no matter how you look at it. And Father, again, we know that we are dependent on you to restrain evil. In our lives every day, we're dependent on you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for the truth that you were working all things out according to the counsel of your will, that Christ is our rock, that you are a refuge and fortress, our ever-present help in times of trouble. Dear Father, this morning we pray and we think about those that have been affected by the fires this past week. Dear Lord, as we're well aware of the horse called fire, and dear Father, we pray for safety for people, we pray for safety for firefighters, for professionals that are working in this situation. Dear Father, we pray for homes, for structures, that they would be spared Thank you for the good news yesterday that there has not been a loss so far. At least that was the last I had heard. We pray that that would continue, Lord. Dear Father, we pray this morning for the needs of this congregation. Dear Father, we pray this morning for Countless Cartwright. Dear Father, for healing for her, I, for peace. Father, we We pray for peace for Jake and Shannon, dear Father, for Scott and Dawn, for their family. Dear Father, we thank you for direction that you've given them even recently. And dear Father, we just pray for your your hand over that whole situation. Dear Father, we thank you that Nancy Kelty can be here today. Lord, we pray for continued healing for her eye. Dear Lord, we pray for Reese Neal, healing for his stomach. This morning, the issues that he's been having, Lord, we pray for Craig and Angie as they walk with him through this. We pray this morning for Renee Banks, Father. Our hearts are heavy as we think about news that she's received this past week of the lesions in her brain. Father, would you bring comfort to Mike? Would you bring comfort to Renee? Would you help us as a body to wrap them in your love? I pray that they would sense your loving arms around them, even this morning. And dear Father, I pray for Helene Van Dyken as she goes in for scans this week in Arizona. We pray for Rick. We pray for their family, Lord, that you would continue to sustain them through all of this. Lord, we love you. We need you. We're so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, once again for the hope that we have in him. Would you pour out your blessing on us now as we look into your word? Would you transform us into the image of Christ? Would you sanctify us by your truth? Your word is truth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. The games of the 33rd Olympiad, the Paris Olympics, will be taking place in just a couple weeks from July 26 to August 11. How many of you knew that, that that was taking place this summer? I think that many of you are raising your hands and the rest of you are not telling the truth. (laughs) Millions around the world will be watching as 10,000 672 athletes from 206 nations compete for a gold medal. 
Well, I'm sure that every athlete is aiming for the gold. I believe that many of them would say that they would be satisfied if they perform their best. That's debatable, I know. But if you were an Olympian, wouldn't that be what you would be thinking? At the very least, at the very least, they certainly want to finish their race or whatever event they're scheduled to participate in. They have spent years, think about this, they have spent years of their lives being trained and subjecting themselves to rigorous mental, physical, and emotional discipline. And now they want to run. They want to run with endurance the race or event that is set before them. Isn't that so similar to what the writer of Hebrews is saying in our text here today? The summary of my message this morning is this. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now I'm going to begin today or continue today in a little different manner. I want to ask a question of this text right off the bat. The question that I want to ask of this text is this. Who is this cloud of witnesses? Have you ever thought about that with Hebrews chapter 12? This is a relatively well-known text, isn't it? Have you ever thought this about this text? Who is this crowd of witnesses? This, I always want to say crowd, it's cloud. Who is this cloud of witnesses? Is it, is, it, is it all the believers that have gone on before us? That's sometimes what I've thought. Watching and cheering us on from heaven. I, I've got to admit to you this morning that I have found joy. I have found joy and even motivation in the thought that my brother Dan who is my hero until he passed away in 2003, or my grandpa, my grandpas, or my grandmas, or best dad. I've taken thought and uh, I've taken taken joy, I've found joy and even motivation in thinking that they're looking down on me, cheering me on. Go, Mark, go. Go, Mark, go. Keep going. Don't stop, Mark. Don't give up. I can't tell you how many times I've thought that about my brother Dan. But is that an accurate representation of what this text is teaching? And shouldn't that be our goal? to really see what this text is is teaching. Well, well, first of all, nowhere else does the New Testament give us a picture of saints in heaven watching saints on earth. Nowhere else in the New Testament. And furthermore, wouldn't it be slightly depressing to them if they could see what was happening on earth? Now, that's not really biblical, but I think it's a good point. No, this this is an example of where considering the context of a text is so important. The writer of Hebrews is saying here, in a way similar to an athlete being spurred on by fans cheering in the stands, believers are to be spurred on by the faith of those that have gone on before us. Spurred on by the faith of those that have gone on before us. The Hebrew audience would understand this well. They were acquainted with the ancient Olympics. 
So again, in a way similar to an athlete in the ancient Olympics being spurred on by fans cheering in the stands, believers are to be spurred on to run with endurance the race set before us by the faith of those that have gone on before us. Do you see that? That's different. That's different than thinking they're up there in heaven cheering us on. No, we are seeing their faith. Isn't that the point of chapter 11? We see their faith and we are spurred on by their faith. That's what this great cloud of witnesses is about. So having established that, we can move on. And our text for today gives us three ways that we are to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Three ways. First, throwing off hindrances. That's going to be really good. The second part, looking to Christ. That is also excellent, most excellent. And then number three, understanding the Lord's discipline rightly. That's going to be a little harder for us. First, we are to run by throwing off hindrances. Look with me at verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, every weight. I'm going to stop right there. We are to lay aside every weight. It's interesting to me that the ancient Olympic athletes performed without clothing. Without going too far into detail there, the reason that they did that, there were a couple of reasons. The one that I want to mention here this morning is that it would remove any hindrance. And doesn't that make sense? What I wanted to do this morning, if we hadn't moved this past week, is to find my snowsuit and come up here in my snowsuit and try to run down the center aisle. I would have loved to have done that. And, and you could have seen. He, he can't run in his snowsuit. And if I had had my boots on, it would have been even worse. I, I have no idea where those things are right now, so I couldn't do that this morning. But it makes sense to us, doesn't it? We, we might watch the Olympics these days and we might think they wear very, very little. Well, yes, they do. And this is the reason why. It's to remove any hindrance that would keep them from running or performing as fluidly as possible. The writer of Hebrews is saying, believers... Brothers and sisters in Christ, get rid of anything that hinders your ability to run. Get rid of anything that hinders your ability to run. Isn't it so fascinating that he starts the text this way? Get rid of anything that hinders your ability to run. Referring to this text, John Piper exhorted believers to ask themselves, does it help me to run? This thing in my life, whatever it may be, does it help me to run? If our goal is to finish the race, the Christian life, if our goal is to finish it with endurance and to make it to heaven, to make it to eternity with Christ, and that, that, of course, that's our goal, right? As believers, as those who have been changed by the Spirit, who have been given new hearts, who have trusted Christ with our lives. That's what we want, right? To make it to the end. To make it to eternity with Christ. And if that's our goal, isn't this a great question for us to ask? Does it help me to run? Does it help me to pursue Christ? Does it help me in achieving that goal? Wouldn't it be beneficial? Wouldn't it be beneficial to examine our lives in this way? And this morning, I'm giving you permission. Isn't that nice of me? I'm giving you permission. 
Examine your life. Take a few moments. Look over your past couple of days. Look over your past week. Think about the activities that you've been involved in. And then we could go back so much further, couldn't we? And we could be so much more detailed about this. But is it helping you to run? The writer of Hebrews is saying, throw it off. Put it off. Lay it aside. Don't be hindered by that anymore. Rather than saying, how close can I get to the edge of the cliff? How close can I come to the line without actually sinning? Which PG-13 movie can I watch without falling into sin? Can I watch Game of Thrones? I have no idea what's popular right now. That used to be popular. Can I, can I t- take part in that without... See, is, is it helping me to run rather than asking, how close can I get to that line? When I was a high school student, when I was a college student, we, we, we had this thing, this, this campaign called True Love Waits. And, and it was all about abstinence until marriage. And, and, but, but the question that we were asking in high school and, and probably in college as well was, how close can you get to the line? The writer of Hebrews is saying, that's not the right question. That is not the right question. Wouldn't it be better to say, does this particular practice, this habit, this attitude, this TV show, this movie, this song, this hobby, does it help me to run? What? What a question. Now, now, don't get me wrong. These things that, that we're talking about, the, the habits, the attitudes, TV shows, they're not necessarily sinful in and of themselves. I'm not saying that. But do they help us to run the race that is set before us? Do they? In order to truly examine our lives, we need to have some bandwidth, don't we? How many of us are sitting around with time on our hands, twiddling our thumbs, saying, I I just want to examine my life right now? Isn't it true that most of us are busy running from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next? If, If you're parents of young kids, I know that's true of you. Oftentimes. We need some bandwidth. We need an opportunity to take some time and really look at our everyday life and say, does it help me to run? I want to encourage every one of us, do this today. Do this today. I believe the Holy Spirit will help us discern what is hindering us if we really want to know. Don't you think he would do that for us? So first, we're to throw off every weight, but then look with me at the end of verse 1. It says, let us throw off the sin which clings so closely, the the sin that clings so closely. This is like, and, and, and I don't think they had this in the days of the scripture being written, but I think about getting clothes out of our dryer, and inevitably, I can never find that one sock and, and it seems like our dryer is eating socks. But, but inevitably, it is connected to that shirt. And it's always inside. You don't see it right away. And then it's, oh, shake it out, and there it is. I, I don't think that's too far from the picture that's being painted here. You, you can't shake that sin off sometimes. Isn't that the nature of sin in our lives sometimes. It clings to us. I've got to be honest with you. Beth and I have been dealing with sin in our lives for years. And even this past week, we had some sin that the Holy Spirit brought to mind revealed to us. God in his kindness helped us to see it. And now we can deal with it. Patterns that had been there for years. 
And that's what I think of here, this sin that clings so closely. It's like you can't shake it off. But the picture here is throw it off. Lay it aside. Be done with that. They are hindering our ability to run the race. Brothers and sisters, are we actively doing this? Are we throwing off what hinders us? So first we are to throw, we are to run by throwing off hindrances. Second, we are to run by looking at Jesus. And this is going to be a much shorter point. We are to run by looking to Jesus. Would you look with me, please, at verse 2? It says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This, t- this text does some amazing, amazing work for us. It helps us to see who he is. It helps us to see who Christ is. He's the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He's the author. He is the originator of our faith. But not only that, he's the perfecter. Isn't that great news? Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He who began a good work and you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. He is going to finish his work. So he is the author. He is the founder. He is the perfecter. He is the finisher. He is the completer. And I want to say this morning, is this true of you? Have you been made new? Are you trusting Jesus Christ for your Savior? That he died for your sins. Is he the founder and perfecter of your faith? Can you claim this truth for yourself? I I pray that today would be the day. Repent. Turn away from your sin and trust Christ. Do it today. So we see who he is, but we also see what he's done, what he did. Look with me at the second part of verse 2. It says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That's what he did. He endured the cross and he despised the shame. What does it mean that he despised the shame? Is that that something that you've ever wondered about? This is kind of a strange phrase. Well, it means that he thought very little. He didn't make too much of He put that under the joy that he knew would be his by accomplishing the Father's will through his crucifixion on the cross. That's what it means to despise the shame. He gave very little thought to it. He didn't put a lot of stock in it. It was so well worth it for Christ. So we see what he's done We see who he is, and then we see where he is. Look with me at the last part of verse 2. It says, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We saw this in Hebrews chapter 7, that even now this means he is interceding for the saints. He's interceding for you. He's interceding for me if we are in Christ. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? So look to Jesus. Fix our eyes on him. Continue to remember who he is, what he's done, what he's doing. As we do that, we're encouraged to run the race with perseverance. Run with endurance, the race That is set before us. So we are to run with endurance the race set before us by throwing off hindrances, by looking at Jesus, and then finally, we are to run by understanding the Lord's discipline rightly. I really, really wish that I had been able to get my notes to Kelly before the bulletins printed this week. It just wasn't possible. And so I know that I'm asking you a lot 
to see what's on the PowerPoint, to be able to digest it. Some of you are writing furiously. I appreciate that. We are run by understanding the Lord's discipline rightly. Look with me, please, at verses 4 through 11. I'm not going to keep you here long, I promise. Verses 4 through 11. It says this, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I want to share with you four truths about the Lord's discipline. Quickly, I'm going to do this quickly. The first truth is this. We should expect it. We should expect it as his children. We should expect painful trials in our lives. That's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, these painful trials that these Hebrews, these believers, these early believers we're going through. We should expect these kinds of things as his children. You see that in this text, don't you? You you are true sons and daughters of the king. That's when you know that that verifies, it gives proof to the fact that you're his sons and daughters. If you are undergoing his discipline, That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We should expect it. It it shouldn't surprise us when these difficulties come. The second truth about discipline, the Lord's discipline, is not found in this text, but I want to mention it because I really believe it wholeheartedly. We may not always know what it is. We might not always know what it is. Is is that thing that happened to me this past week, is that, was that his discipline? Or or was that just the result of living in a fallen world? Or or that there, was that his discipline? I don't know. And and what about that thing that happened back there? That was really hard. And and, and, and was that his discipline? The truth is, we may never know. We may never know what it is, and we may never know exactly why it came. Brothers and sisters, again, I can't point to a scripture verse to support that statement, but I believe it's true. We may not know. We may not know what it is. We may not know why it came. But this is what we can know for sure from this text. And this is number three. We can always know that it's for our good. We can always know that his discipline, these painful trials that he allows into our lives, that he brings into our lives, are for our good. That's what we've been singing about this morning. That's what we've been talking about this morning. They're for our benefit. Look with me again at verse 10. It says, They, our earthly fathers, discipline us for a short time as has seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Any discipline that he allows into our lives 
any discipline that he brings into our lives is so that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. It's for our good. It's for our good as much as it does not feel good. We are not to go by our feelings, are we, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to what we believe to be true. This is what God's word says. It is for our good. Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. We've already alluded to this text this morning, but I want to read it here for you. It says, and we know that for those that, who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Brothers and sisters, this is his goal for us, that we be conformed to the image of Christ, that, that we take on the holiness of Christ, not only positionally, the way God sees us right now positionally, because we're in Christ, he sees us as holy, but also progressively. There's the idea of progressive sanctification. We're growing in Christ-likeness all the time, all the time. That is his goal for us, that we become like Christ, that we be holy. And he disciplines us to that end. That's number three. The fourth truth is that we have to endure through it. We have to endure through his discipline. That's what verse 7 says. Would you look with me one more time at verse 7? It says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. We have to endure. We have to endure through this discipline. It means that we remain steadfast. It means we continue on. Even though times are difficult, even though life can be so hard. The writer of Hebrews continues to say, endure, run with perseverance, the race, run with endurance, the race that is set before you. Brothers and sisters, may it be true of us. May we run with endurance, the race set before us, throwing off hindrances, looking to Christ, and understanding the Lord's discipline rightly. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me now? Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for your word. We are grateful for this truth. Dear Father, we thank you for this challenge that we endure that we run with endurance the race that is set before us. Dear Father, we know that and we're grateful for the truth that you don't leave us. You don't, you don't leave us to throw off the sin, to lay aside every hindrance, every weight. You, you, don't, you don't leave us to do that on our own. You've equipped us with the Holy Spirit and you've given us your grace. And so, therefore, the call on our lives is that we be holy as you are holy. So, Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you all that Christ has done for us. And we, would, we pray that you would help us keep our eyes fixed on him, the author, the founder, and the perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. So helpful. Thanks, Pastor Mark. We're going to end uh, this morning by singing I Surrender All. Stand with us as we do that, church.
just one thing that I want to mention before you leave today, or before you take part in the potluck. Um, that is that VBS is starting in a week from tomorrow, and preparations are, are going um, full force over the next week or so. Um, so I'd invite you to be in prayer for VBS as those preparations are made. I'm going to pray for the food. Um, I'm going to pray for VBS, and then I'll close um, with the benediction. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, we do want to pray this morning for VBS. We pray for the, the preparations. We pray for Miss Alexa. We pray for all of the leaders that are involved in that. Lord, we pray that you would bless the prep preparations mightily. Dear Father, that you would be drawing um, kids to come. Um, dear Father, that you would change lives as a result of that week. And dear Father, we pray for this time of potluck, now this time of fellowship. We just pray your blessing on the food. We pray your blessing on the fellowship. Lord, we pray that it would be glorifying to you, that we would be edified through this time. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we leave this place. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks so much for being here, man. God bless you as you go. Yeah.